All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Dog Sports Decoded. Uh, in today's podcast, we'll be discussing three mistakes you might be making when benching at a trial and how to avoid them. Uh, my name is Megan Ritchie, and today I'm talking with competitor and dog trainer Jade Zwingli about benching mistakes that stop most handlers dead in their tracks uh, really before they even get started. So welcome, Jade. Thanks for having me, Megan. My pleasure. Um, really excited to talk to you about this. Uh, Jade is a well-known competitor and trainer and has developed a great system when it comes to benching at a trial and she's graciously agreed to share some of that hard-earned knowledge with us today um, to help us avoid some of the more damaging mistakes and understand how we can have more success at a trial. So uh, welcome again and thank you for joining us and uh, let's jump right in I guess. Uh, my first question is um, really just how you got started. Uh, what's your background and experience competing and training? Um, so handlers know a little bit more about who you are and where you're coming from and, uh, and kind of how you can relate to where they are right now. Okay, well, I started in dog sports uh, really young, actually. I was heavily involved in show jumping. And when I was transitioning out of horses, uh, I happened to have dogs uh, who, one of whom was a rescue and had some serious confidence issues. So with her and uh, my other dog that we had at the time, we were taking agility classes. And it just kind of grew from there. I started competing in agility and rally obedience pretty much right away, jumped in with both feet. So that was, that was super fun and exciting. And then since then, I've gone on to compete in a lot of different sports. Um, so everything from barn hunt uh, to disc dog. I've done a little bit of confirmation, although that was pretty stressful for me. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've competed online. I've competed in Canada. I've competed in the U.S. I've run trials. Uh, I do a lot of running of trials now. And I'm a judge for this dog and for Carol. Yeah, so it was one of the ex reasons I was really excited to have you on because I know you've been hosting a lot of trials, so you've kind of seen what other people have done as well, kind of what's worked, what doesn't work, and maybe how people can get a little bit more out of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm lucky enough that when I'm running these trials, it's often my students that are coming to compete. Right. So I can help coach them and get them ready and kind of set them off on the best foot possible. Yeah, I know you've helped me a lot in that regard. So, uh, so definitely the same. Um, and uh, you're always so positive about it and encouraging. So I love that. Thank you. Um, and when you kind of when did you start professionally dog, dog training, just to kind of give people a bit of a background? Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> probably 2005. Okay. Around then I worked for the Humane Society. Um, so okay. I I transitioned into dog training in a weird way. It started by helping people who were adopting dogs out uh, with training advice. Okay. And then it grew into teaching classes. Um, and then I wrote my CPDT exam and went at, uh, went out pretty hard after that. Uh, <laughs> do a lot of private lessons now. I mostly deal with behavior concerns. Yeah. Um, and then I, I've, I've been teaching rally weekly forever now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, all right, so I guess we'll uh, we'll just jump right into our, our kind of our mistakes then. Um, so what have you seen as kind of the, the first mistakes you've seen handlers make and kind of what the impact is on their dogs? Well, the biggest thing is when someone is new to dog shows, they tend to be really nervous uh, and that translates to their dog. And they tend to try and bench their dog as close as possible to the action. Right mostly because they want to watch um, but unfortunately that's kind of the worst thing we can do we want our dogs to be able to decompress in between their runs and we want to have them in a quiet space as much as possible every show has its own challenges but if you scout out those quiet areas you're just going to give your dog more of a chance to relax in between their turn right and so for a lot of first-time competitors it might be their first time in any sport so it's totally new environment for the dog, for the handler, um, let alone for more experienced competitors or just jumping from sport to sport. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if uh, being in the kind of the middle of the action is the wrong place to be, where would you set up instead? I try to scout out my locations where I compete beforehand, uh, whenever possible. Now that's, that's not always possible. <laughs> 
especially when you're traveling to an event. Right. So what I like to do is get in there as soon as possible. If I'm traveling to an event, I'll usually plan my travel so that I'm arriving at the beginning of benching setup. I don't want to get there last minute. Yeah. I also like to inquire with the trial secretary or chair in advance of what my benching options can be. Um, because every trial has their own rules. Some you're allowed to bench out of your car. Um, some you can bench outside. Some have indoor benching only. Like there can be various rules. So if you've inquired ahead of time, then you at least know what you're walking into and what you need for setup as well. Right. Um, so just you just mentioned kind of the trial secretary. Do you want to just like briefly talk about what that person does and kind of what their role is? It's like they're such a valuable resource. Yeah, so your trial secretary, it varies a little bit depending on what organization, but generally speaking, they're the person you're sending your entries into. Yeah. So they're managing that side of the registration process, and they're generally the point of contact for a competitor asking any number of questions. Um, and every organization has different rules, so getting clarification on things you're not sure of from that person is invaluable. Yeah, and they've they have already been to the facility, so they know the layout, probably have hosted multiple trials there, so they can really help somebody. Yeah, usually. Sometimes yeah. they haven't. <laughs> but usually, and, and yeah. I find even if they haven't, they can usually ask. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, I think we'll just skip ahead then to number two, unless you had something to add to that. Uh, no, I think that covers okay. staying out of the craziness. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so what's the, what's the second biggest mistake you see people kind of making when they're heading to their first trial? So I, I tend to compete a lot at outdoor trials just with the nature of the sports I'm in. However, this would apply to inside as well. Having a visual block for your dog so they're not staring at the field of play or at a bunch of other dogs um, yeah. that might be excited. So I'm a really big fan of tarps. I use them a lot. Uh, you can use sunshades. Just check what the visual barrier actually looks like to the dog. So if you hold up your Illuminate in front of your face and you can see straight through it, it's not actually a visual block. Right. So you want to kind of pair visual blocks along with the fact that you need airflow for your dogs if it's hot. <laughs> yes. So you don't want to suffocate them or anything. Yeah. Sometimes it can be strategically putting like your bags or your boxes. And I have a little wagon I bring to trials and I'll put my wagon in front of my dog's crate. And now I have a visual block. So she's not staring at the field to play, becoming excited because yeah. our dogs usually really want to play. I guess I'm, I should have started with this, but um, for people that don't know what benching is, maybe I should backtrack and just talk about what benching is. Um, so usually when you show up at a show, you need to keep your dog somewhere between your run. So when we talk about benching here, whether it's indoor or outdoor, uh, that could be in a crate, an X pen, or a car. So it's just wherever you're keeping your dog in between your runs, essentially. And that's a good clarification to make. We've had competitors show up with just their dog on leash. Yeah. And not knowing what to expect or what to do. And luckily, most of us usually have extra stuff and we can help them out. Yeah. But it, it's another stress the person doesn't need. Right. And a very long day if you're there for six or eight hours and you've just got your dog on the leash the whole time. So exactly. OK, so back to the visual blocker now for dogs in the kennel or the X pen or your car, you're setting up tarps just well, like you said, to block their visual so they're not barking at other dogs or people if they're going by. Yeah, or you can get a sunshade, or some people have canopies with walls. There, there's so many options depending on your personal preference. I select my benching mostly on whether I'm going to actually be sitting with my dogs or not. Okay. So if I'm not going to be with them very much, say I'm judging or running the event, then I'm going to do a much smaller setup than I would if I'm like hanging out with them. Right. So that, that can vary how you set up too. And kind of knowing what to expect, like if you're going to a trial and you want to volunteer a lot and be in the action, you're not necessarily sitting with your dog, that's right. going to change your benching setup a bit. Yeah. And volunteering is always a great way to get to know um, a little bit more of the rules and, uh, you know, obviously helps the club out, but it can help you learn a lot too. Like I know in Barn Hunt, they really promote that and it's incredible what you can pick up watching. And like you were saying earlier, just people wanting to be in the middle of the action, there's no better way to see what's what's going on. Yeah, and we usually recommend, like if you haven't trialed yet, to actually come out and volunteer first. Because then you, you can see what everyone's doing and how it works. And yeah. It makes everything flow a lot better for you when it's your first time. Yeah, for sure. Okay, um, so if we jump ahead then to um, number three, I guess already. Uh, yeah. what's, what's the next benching mistake you see people making? I see a lot of people not practicing self-care. 
Okay. So they're all worked up at trials. They're not necessarily taking care of themselves. So they have everything for their dog set out. The dog has water, the dog has treats, the dog has like a comfortable bed. <laughs> great setup yeah. they're not taking care of themselves so we have to remember the handler can be really stressed too yeah so having a place where you can get out of the sun and yeah. having supplies with you to keep you hydrated and fed throughout the day yeah. and staying off your phone so you're not just obsessing <laughs> with what's going on on social media Isn't you want to have your head in the game and it's it's a great time to make friends yeah at dog shows so setting yourself up so that you can relax and socialize as well is really important. Okay, and what, what would your kind of top suggestions be then for somebody that is a little nervous going in, which is pretty much everybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you know someone going to the trial. That yeah. really helps. Having a friend or another classmate or your coach going can be a huge difference. For me, it definitely was. I remember I walked into my first trial ever. It was an agility trial, and I didn't know anybody there. Yeah. Now, because I didn't know anyone there, it didn't mean I didn't have fun. Yeah. I walked up to some friendly older ladies who were standing yeah. by the run order, and yeah. uh, I asked them how to play the games I was entered in. Yeah. <laughs> and they explained them, and they were so nice and supportive, and you will find that at dog shows. Yeah. So just take the time to you know, smile and make some new friends, and if you can, bring a buddy with you too. Okay. Um, I, my first experience was very similar, I would say, with agility. Again, it's a couple of really nice older ladies that have been there, kind of done that, and just super helpful, and, you know, tell you where the setup is, and where you can find the secretary, even, and washrooms, and whatever other questions you have, so, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's the great thing about dog shows. We're all excited to be there. Yeah. Um, so, so sort of what, what would go wrong if we are terribly nervous? What, what sort of the impact on our dog and our performance if we're... We're not doing uh, self-care. Yeah, I've seen this happen to a lot of people and it's kind of, it breaks my heart because the dog's totally prepared and they've done all the back training and they're, they should do well, right. but they get in their own head and they get so stressed. And like, these are often people that, you know, they start to shut down and they feel nervous and you can tell they're not eating, they're not drinking enough. And the best thing you can do if you're feeling really nervous is actually ask to volunteer right away. Okay. So if there's an opportunity at your child to volunteer and run in it, if you start volunteering, it keeps you busy. It also gives you a chance to interact with people right away. Yeah. So if you're an introverted person, I mean, it gives you a chance to kind of break out of that so you're not getting in your head too much. Yeah. It's really helpful. So like in an agility trial, what I'll try to do is planned so that I'm not in the first run necessarily. So I don't have to worry about my dog as much. I get there early and make sure he's peed and pooped and all that stuff. And then I can go help out and kind of just get in the flow of the trial. And that helps. Okay. Um, so what can people do other than like obviously going there first, um, like I said, or be there early. So you're not, not so nervous, but um, is there anything else they can do to sort of prepare? Like, uh, you've been very generous and provide us with a little checklist, but if, if they've got kind of a list prepared to so say, no, they have everything on them. Is that sort of the thing that would also reduce? Yeah, I find having all your stuff packed up the night before, if you can, or at least know where it all is. Yeah. I hate that morning scramble where it's 5 a.m. and you're like, where did I put that? Yeah. It happens to all of us, but it's not ideal. So yeah. having your stuff organized beforehand and then developing a trial routine for you and your dog. Okay. So that your dog knows what to expect too. Like every time I get to a trial, the first thing I do is I unload my van because I usually have event equipment with me too. Yeah. Get all that out. And then we walk the dogs and we just, we take them for an on-leash walk. We go somewhere where we're not running into a lot of people or dogs. And we just have that unwind moment where we've gone from the frantic packing and traveling to we're here, everything's under control <laughs> and uh, we can make sure we're done peeing so we don't pee in the ring. Yes. And just kind of have that moment of decompression before you get into the busy trial atmosphere. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, maybe we should just like run through an example of like how your routine would change. I'll say from like agility to, I don't know, say barn hunt, but what would be the, what would be the difference in how you're preparing your dog? It sounds like not much. You're, you try to keep that routine the same. So you're not changing things on your dog, but what would be some differences you might consider? Yeah, I think I've kept it pretty solidly the same, no okay. matter what event I'm in. I mean, there there's subtle differences. If, if there's heat considerations, um, I might be unpacking and benching slightly differently. Okay. I might be trying to get my dogs out of the vehicle faster and back into the show environment. Yeah. 
Okay. But I really do plan for a walk for them. Okay. And if I know I'm going to be really busy at the trial, because that happens sometimes, like I know I'm going to get there, I'm not going to have extra time. Yeah. I will bring someone with me that's not entered usually. Okay. Yeah. And I, I'm lucky now because I have my husband, but before I've, you know, wrangled my sister into coming and that yeah. kind of thing. My mom, my poor mother, yeah. <laughs> she doesn't even know how to walk two dogs at once. And I bring her and tell her to walk all the dogs. Yeah. Yeah. So asking for help when you need it, especially if you're new. Yeah. All right. Great. Um, we're just sailing along here. Uh, uh, we, I kind of asked you if you had like a bonus um, question you wanted to, to share with our people or sorry, a bonus tip, I should say. Um, what's another mistake maybe you see, see people make? Having a really strong reinforcer with you. So what I mean by that is something that your dog loves. So it, it's not always food either. Like I obviously, I bring really high value food with me to every trial. So I'll, I'll bring hot dog and chicken and cheese and all that good stuff. But for my dogs, especially because they're toy driven, I will make sure I bring a toy that's really special to them. So that if, say I'm playing disc and they're not engaging the way I want them to, I'll take them off field and somewhere in the back and I will play with their exciting toy. Sometimes it's a ball, sometimes it's a type of tug but it gives them a chance to not have the pressure of the game or the sport where they can re-engage with me and get their energy up. Because sometimes our dogs do get stressed and overwhelmed too, especially my young dogs. If I take them to a big cluster show and there's sports going on everywhere around us, I need to be able to reconnect with them. So having like a good tug session can really help with that. Okay. Um, and uh, I don't know, not really related to that, but how would, um, how would you prepare differently? Like, we talked a little bit earlier, but like between heat and cold. So if you're dealing with that as well, you know, like pulling your dog out quickly or maybe even getting them back to the car quickly if it's kind of a cold outdoor event. What? Yeah, so I've competed in everything from like over 30 degrees outside to minus 10 in a blizzard. Yeah. So that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing I have learned is to bring things for multiple weather conditions, even if I'm kind of expecting a certain condition. Yeah. Because it can change no matter where you're competing. Yeah. So having things like dog coats with me, they're in one of my totes. So I have two jackets in there along with my tarps and my blankets and stuff. So I can grab them if I need them. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the back on track jackets. Um, they're great for keeping muscles warm and things like that. Use them in all weather, yeah. thankfully. Um, those are great. I also keep gloves in my bag. Um, I have gloves all the time. I play Frisbee, so obviously we don't want cold hands, yeah. but anytime you're handling a leash or you're working with your dog or you're feeding treats, you don't want cold hands either. Yeah. Having hot pockets with you. And then on the same vein, if it's, it's hot outside, I have cooling pads in that tote too. Yeah. I have a copious amounts of water I bring with me to trials for me and the dogs. Yeah. Uh, we have cooling coats, we have fans, we have all of that stuff always packed with us so we can adapt to the situation without stress. And I can also usually give some stuff to other people. <laughs> yeah. Well, you make a good point kind of to the be prepared for everything because, you know, I guess in my experience, it's been more the hot weather that's been an issue. So if you go expecting a cold day and it ends up being hotter and you don't have your tarps or like for me, I've just got a car cover. Mm -hmm. Um, which isn't ideal. So if it hits that 30 degrees, it's, it's really, really hard to keep them cool enough in the car or whatever, or, but same thing, you could be going to a trial expecting you're going to be benched inside and then all of a sudden you're panicked because they've changed the setup and you can't bench inside. Yeah. And that's happened. I've actually had an event that was slated to run inside and they moved the event outside. Oh, geez. <laughs> so you, you, you really do have to prepare for everything. And if you have multiple options with you you're just going to be less stressed yeah and then i i would say if you walk into an event and things have dramatically changed and you are really stressed and unprepared to maybe consider just going home yeah that's a good point we don't want to work our dogs when we're in a state of anxiety it's not fair to them it's not going to be a good experience for you or them or go home re-prepare come back later miss your few runs if you need to like it's yeah. really not the end of the world to walk away if you have to yeah that's a, it is a good point. I know I was at a barn hunt trial, I think in the fall and uh, I had my car covered and then I think it started to rain. So I pulled the cover off and then I went in and volunteered and then the sun came out. So I'm stuck in the ring volunteering until this, this um, uh, blind is, is done. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, meanwhile, the car is heating up. So I'm worried the whole time that, you know, my dog's going to die in the car overheating and you know, you're kind of stuck in that, not knowing what to do, where to, you know, 
Yeah, I've had that happen too. Usually I'll yell at someone and throw my keys at them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, it brings us back to make some friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some instant friends. Yeah. Please go People save will my always dog. help you with the welfare of your dogs. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Um, if you had to uh, kind of pick like two or three things you wouldn't go to a show without as far as kind of benching or just general preparation, what would, what would that sort of look like? Ah, oh, geez. The, well, if we take away crates and like the obvious stuff, okay. uh, I definitely love my Illuminet. <laughs> I've got my eye on one. I, I can't wait to get one. I have it in multiple sizes. It, I love it because it can convert my car into a crate with that really easily, even if it's hot outside. Um, and then if I'm benching outside, it's great. If I'm going to an indoor trial, it's not as necessary. But if I'm competing inside and my vehicle is getting hot out all day, I'll use it then too. Right. So that one's pretty important. Uh, like I said, having a toy or something that's not related to my sport that my dog loves, that's like definitely something I always bring. Okay. And then this last one's kind of funny. My dogs aren't spayed. So I have to have dog panties with me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you just never know. Yeah. And it can catch you off guard, especially if you're traveling, if their heat cycle comes at a weird time. So. When you were talking about competing in the U.S. or something like not mm -hmm. always very easy to go find those at the local pet store or whatever if you if you've left the house without them and you're. Like, yeah, if you're at a confirmation show, they're usually pretty easy to grab there. But overall, <laughs> not so much. Yeah. So I always have two sets of those. Yeah. <laughs> 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 which is which is super funny to have but it's it's something I don't forget I need to have them yeah well you've obviously learned that one the hard way too so <laughs> <laughs> usually that's how these things stick in our head anyway yeah for sure yeah um is there anything else I haven't maybe asked you about that I, I should have or um that you'd like to mention that might help people I think the biggest thing is to know your dog and to kind of learn what works for them and play with it no, no dog is ever the same. Like every dog has a different amount of time they need to get ready. Some dogs, if you bring them out too early, will become very stressed. Some dogs thrive on that and need to calm down. So a lot of it's learning your dog. And I really, really recommend trying to go to fun matches and even practice your trial schedule and routine in a class. Like if I'm taking a dog training class, to practice going through those motions and then go to my class so that I at least can see how it's affecting my dog and if I'm being successful. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Mm -hmm. Definitely, like, not everybody will obviously know the high-tailed setup, but, um, you know, if you're taking classes somewhere, uh, very easy, like, especially with agility, so many people bring crates in, set them up, you can practice that benching while you're kind of waiting for your next turn. Yeah, exactly. And, and kind of test out that procedure and figure out like, okay, is my dog going to bark the whole time? Some other dog's working. Do I need a visual barrier like you were talking about? Um, yeah. Yeah. And the more you can do that, the better. Like even um, if I have a new puppy and my other dog is in a class, I'll bring the puppy in a crate to that class and I will practice working on benching. Uh, so I guess sort of related, what would you do if you had a dog that was barking a lot? You Maybe you've got your bar visual barrier set up, they're in the crate, but um, you know, they're still barking or just stressed in general. Like they don't have to be barking. Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways you can try and tackle that. Some dogs will do really well if you give them a bone or a tendon or something to chew. I've done stuffed Kongs. Um, now, some dogs don't. They won't respond to that in a trial environment at all. So again, it's it's kind of trial by error there. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a really big fan of benching out of my vehicle so that my dogs are just removed from the sound. Now, if I can't, bringing a small radio where I can play really low level music has helped before. That's, that's a great idea, yeah. Yeah, it depends on the dog. One dog I did work her in a thunder shirt. Um, and again, it wasn't on all day or anything like that, but it helped her at the beginning. Uh, she had serious separation anxiety when being created in one of my first um, dogs. So sometimes I would bring a friend to hold her for the first um, one, like part of the day, because I had to walk the course. So she would hold her in her arms and get her calmed down. And then we'd transition her to the crate and have someone just drop cookies in randomly. And as the day went on, the dog would be totally fine. But she needed that prep in the morning. So again, I had to plan for her needs. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you want to walk us through maybe how you set up your your Jeep is kind of, uh, I'll say your base or your truck that you, you work out of. Um, do you want to kind of walk, walk us through how you would set that up? And I can talk about mine afterwards, maybe. Yeah, I've had a lot of different vehicles, and right now we have an F-150, uh, which is awesome, because I can fit an X-Pen in it. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and I'm lucky in that my dogs can be benched together. Um, they don't have to be in separate crates, but I could easily do two crates in the back of there as well. Yeah. I like doing the wire um, for our truck because I can lift up, uh, the, there's a big sunroof that opens up, there's a back window and then all the side windows so we can get really great airflow. And then I'll throw a big aluminette over the whole thing. And that works really good. And then we can clip water buckets in and whatnot. I can put cooling pads down if I need to. So that's my favorite setup. Yeah. Uh, when I had my Jeep Wrangler, we had uh, a barrier that kept the dogs in the back of the Jeep. And that worked really well. My dogs are not destructive, so they're not seatbelt eaters or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> if they were, I, yeah, if they were, I would use crates. I've always been lucky in that my dogs um, haven't done that behavior, but it's to be expected. So honestly, like if you have a young dog that you're crating under your vehicle for the first time, using a crate or an X pen with a lid on it yeah. is recommended for sure. Yeah, better that they, I'll say, destroy or chew the crate than um, your entire vehicle. So. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, if, you, if you're creating a young dog, checking on them pretty frequently or having a friend that can help tag team you with that, is, it's really important. Yeah. Um, so I'll just, I'll share mine, I guess, really quickly. So I've just got a Infiniti G35 sedan, kind of four-door sedan. So I've just bought a, um, just kind of a regular storage cover for that. Um, so I like that. It's kind of got the elastic snaps kind of on each corner. So it kind of generally it holds it pretty well, but really windy conditions can get a little iffy. So with the windows down, that seems to block, I'd say maybe 50% of the sun. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was kind of looking at, uh, at adding some of those luminette or, or something that's a little more solid blocker for the, the main windows. But um, I know my dogs are pretty big, so I actually can't fit a crate in the car with them and everything. So, uh, you know, it's obviously not the best, I'll say ideal setup, but um, you kind of have to work with what you have and, um, and sort of what, what will be, what will work for your dogs. I think bigger dogs may be a little different issue than smaller dogs where you can throw a kennel in the car or easily transport that. So I don't know. Yeah. And if, if you couldn't crate in the car and you needed to, what you could do is actually just get a tent or something that you bring with you to trials. So I've done like a full on camping tent before. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty warm in there once you get it all zipped up and everything too, like if you're worried about coolness. Yeah. And then obviously if it's really hot, tents are not as ideal. Um, and that's when I would go more with like a canopy or something where I can have a luminette for walls instead of solid walls. Right. And yeah. I guess I've seen that kind of like, I think there's some Costco, there's sort of umbrellas, but they've got sort of some, a little bit of a side. Yeah, exactly. Them, so a little more airflow and then yeah, if you're in the luminette on there. Yeah, anything people would buy to go to the beach with their kids kind of right. works pretty good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's such a price range on it too. Like you can get a decent sunshade to fit just crates in for about 50 bucks. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we want to walk through maybe a couple of examples? If I draw out a few examples, you could show us maybe where you'd set up something along those lines. Does that for work? Sure. Okay. Um, let me see if I can figure this out here. <laughs> Uh, can you see that? Uh, it's white. white. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so as kind of an example, I thought I might draw out, because um, I think we're both familiar with it, the um, uh, Fenzi, um, sorry, the Fez, uh, Fez Dome for a job. Oh yeah, yep. So um, I'll see, yeah, typically, so it's kind of a horse arena. Um, and then there's sort of a plexiglass divider and then here's there's yeah there's sort of be a the office area yeah show office in here if it'll let me draw it no nope. <laughs> anyway there'd be a show office in here and then sort of this is the I don't know why it's not letting me do that but um sorry bad drawing but this would be sort of where the uh trial would run for agility and then the way I've seen it, there's sort of some benching here, benching here, benching here, and then sort of a warm up area through here. And then these kind of empty spaces would be um, walkway where people could, uh, if they're on deck, they could warm up or whatever. Um, yeah, so this is a really great example of a setup where you can't really get to a quiet space. And there's not a lot of walls you can bench against and you're right stuck in the middle of a bunch of other dogs, basically, the whole trial. Um, so at the Fez Dome, what I've done is I primarily bench out of my car. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do bring a crate inside. 
Now I bring a crate inside for a couple of reasons. One, I can use it um, when my dog's about to be on the line, but I'm not ready to pull them out yet. Or right after a run, if I'm switching between dogs really fast, which uh, happens to me a lot. My dogs are all in the same flip and height. <laughs> Yeah. And they tend to get to the same level really fast. So yeah. having the crate there for quick exchanges is helpful too. Um, but I don't leave my dog in a crate in that environment all day long. Like even my senior dogs, I find it's just too much for them. So I'll have a covered crate. I'll have water. Um, I'll have my training toys and snacks there so that everything's easy to grab. But I'm, I'm benching out of my car again. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's been my, I'll say my experience too. I've just benched out of my car here. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, often, uh, probably another reason you bench or at least inside, at least have a crate set up. It's like if somebody's walking in, they've got a reactive dog, something like that. You can put your dog in the crate. And once they're through, you can kind of swap your own dog out too. Yeah, it just, it gives you space options for putting your dog away and getting them away from anything you don't want them near. Sometimes when certain dogs run on course too, it's a lot. They're really loud. They're really animated. Um, sometimes they're a flight risk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't love being rushed by a dog that's running out of the ring either. Right. Um, so having a crate there just gives you more options to make sure your dog's not out too early. Okay. Um, anything else you want to touch on with this part? Or I'll, I can throw up another example. Oh, uh, we can do another example. Okay. Uh... So I thought maybe we just do like Hightails has had a few rally trials. So I thought I'd just draw that out. We've kind of got a, uh, a warm up space mm -hmm. and then sort of our main, I'll see our main training area. And along here, there'd be some indoor benching and then all outside of the building um, for car benching, I guess. So yeah. So again, at Hightails, I bench out of my car. <laughs> you guys yeah. are going to get a theme here. Um, I don't bench my dogs inside at all at Hightails trials because they're caro trials. And if my dogs bark at all, it could ruin someone's run. And well, let's face it, I have Aussies. They, they do bark on occasion. <laughs> um, the, if you're going to bench inside, um, and I've seen people do this really successfully, is the dog runs themselves are not suitable to just put your dog in and leave them. We recommend having a crate or an X-Pen within the run. And then if people have added a visual blockade on top of that, it tends to work really well. So having a blanket or a sheet in front of your dog's crate. And being aware of when people are in the ring. So not pulling your dog out, playing with them, kind of being animated with your dog while someone else is going. And you will find that in rally and obedience type trials, that's really, really expected. Uh, versus like a fly ball tournament, everyone's barking, it's crazy in there, it's super <laughs> loud. So being aware of the type of trial that you're competing at is really important. Yeah, and hopefully you have some idea of that from a class or kind of a training session as well. Yeah, and if you can go to fun matches or classes where you're going to be competing, it will typically help your dog a lot. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you're new to trials. I don't have to do that as much anymore, but when I was first, my first probably five years competing, I would try and rent the space that I was going to be competing in. If I could, I mean, obviously arenas are harder, um, but I would take a class in an arena so that my dogs got used to running in the sand and the dirt and having that horse smell there sometimes too. Yeah, well, that's a, yeah, a great point because I know I took my first, um, I guess it was our second agility class with Tess and uh, it was at a horse arena and she just like the whole six weeks could not focus. <laughs> she was spending so much time trying to find horse poop and, and whatever else interested her, like <laughs> almost nothing out of the course and I felt so bad for the instructor but well, it's a perfect place to train because yeah. if you can master it in a class which is the appropriate place to address these things yeah. then you won't be worried when you get to trial time and I do practice with my dogs in the weirdest places like I'll go to a sea train station in Calgary just because of all the smells and people around just practice having that crowd yeah um I don't have any kind of other examples thought through is there something different you would set up as far as um if there was an outdoor trial, something different or kind of pretty sure. much the same? So what we have in Nanaimo is we have a huge soccer field that is our, our field to play, which is sweet. Uh, and then there's a fence and there's a baseball diamond. And we typically will all bench in the baseball diamond. Now, a lot of people like to bench so that they're facing the field. And I do the opposite. I go really far away. <laughs> it's like 10 minute walk over to the field. Yeah. My dogs are way in the back. They're in longer grass even. Like it's a little uncomfortable that way. And I attach their X-Pen to a fence so they can't run around with their X-Pen. 
because that has happened before to me. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then I tarp them up so that they can't hear the timer going off that ready, set, go, because um, that's triggering for my dogs. They know that means they're about to run. <laughs> uh, so we just kind of get them away from the noise and the action that way. Outdoor trials typically give you more space for benching. And the further away you can be, the better. And like I said, for the Fez Dome, you can have a far away benching spot and have a crate near where your, your event is happening to move your dog in and out of quickly. So you can essentially create up two zones. And one is you're like, this is a temporary, we're just gonna use it to make sure we're getting ready for our round on time. And then having a main benching spot where your dog's gonna spend most of the day. Because realistically, they're only coming out for one to three minutes at a time every couple hours. Right. You don't want them in the action for those hours. You want them resting. Yeah, so this is sort of related but unrelated. Uh, you know, kind of a barn hunt example, uh, be it slightly different when you're kind of stuck in a blind. Do you have any thoughts on maybe how to handle that kind of situation? Uh. I have had a hard time in blinds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when I competed in barn hunt, I had a reactive dog who primarily wore a head halter, which is not allowed at barn hunt competitions. Okay. So right off the bat, we didn't have his usual gear. Um, really, really powerful, strong dog, really, really drivey. So as soon as we went in the blind, he would know he was about to go hunt and he would scream scaring all the small dogs in our blind with us, which is super fun. <laughs> yeah. So what I would do, uh, I was bring several really large Kongs, absolutely loaded with peanut butter. Like I'm talking full, full, full. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had the dog on a body harness with um, a leash that attached in two spots to his body harness. And I would pull him up. So I'm sitting down, he's right between my legs looking up at me and I'm holding the Kong for him to lick. And for some reason in the blinds, we were always like the last dog or second last dog to go. So we'd have to wait through everyone else's turns. Yeah. And he would just eat the peanut butter. And yeah. he would cry the whole time he was eating the peanut butter. <laughs> and I would warn people, I'd be like, you know, he, he's a little intense. He's got a lot of energy coming off him. Yeah. Super in advance. Like, this is what I'm dealing with. And people understood, like, they could see that I was working really hard to keep him calm. Yeah. And if, if I had had that dog still, because he did pass away really young, we probably would have worked through it better over time. But when he was starting out, it was really stressful for both of us. Those blinds yeah. are hard. And they're tight spaces. Yeah, I'm just going to kind of draw it out, because not everybody, depending on your sport, you might not actually deal with a blind. But usually it's a uh, so you'd have like your regular benching area and then there's sort of a designated tented area where you would wait and um, uh, kind of get and ready. make them as small as possible too. <laughs> yeah, usually. So um, for barn hunt, it would be, uh, it'll let me, there might be five chairs in here, so I'm just gonna put little stars, but it kind of be that sort of idea where the chair would be and then there'd be say an opening where you're supposed to go out and then actually go to your trial. So, yeah. uh, it's very enclosed, very, uh, I'm sort of the same with you, say you're talking about your, your dog Ari. Um, my dogs are bigger, so they take up a lot more space in this small area. So I'm always jealous of the people with the little dogs who just sit on their laps. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I had done it with terriers. Yeah, I always am the last one to walk in there too. I wait to the last possible second. I'll yeah. walk my dog around outside. I don't wait huddled near the blind to go in. I'm within range where I can hear them, but if they, they're yelling at us to go in, I'll keep walking around till everyone's in and then I, I pop in last. So I have that chair closest to the exit too. And that's kind of why I want to draw this out because I, I, I'll say most of the competitions I've been to, these chairs aren't designated. So like if you're last, you don't have to necessarily go in, say like one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of strategically pick your chair most often has been my experience, but sort of depends yeah. on the trial a little bit. Well, and I find too, if everyone else is in there with a small dog, they move away from you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's all I kind of had for questions today, unless you had some other, other tips. I think that covers the main thing is just to try and set yourself up for success by being as prepared as possible and take into account what's going to make your dog the happiest as well as keeping yourself, you know, settled and relaxed. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think a big thing you kind of touched on earlier was just nerves, like do what you can to kind of knock down your own nerves so you're not passing that off onto your dog. Trust you've done what you need to in your, your training class or, or your fun match you've gone to and then 
just kind of as best you can. It's always easy to say, but try and just go out there and have fun and take whatever lesson you can from it. Yeah. And just remember like the, the awards fade, you forget about them. Like, I know that sounds funny, but I don't remember most of what I've won anymore. Yeah. Um, they're all in a box that my cat sleeps on. <laughs> I should do something about that. <laughs> but um, it's, it's the memory, that good run, that feeling you get after you've had a connection with your animal and mm -hmm if you go into a trial with that expectation that you're, you're just there to actually have fun with your animal, most of us aren't getting paid to compete in dog sports. Um, it, it should be fun. And if it's not, then don't go. Yeah. <laughs> like really it, it needs to be fun. So if you, you keep your expectations, you know, reasonable and you, you just have a small goal that you can be excited about, you're going to leave feeling so much better. Yeah. And, uh, maybe this is just kind of a personal anecdote, but um, I find most people are dealing with some other issue with their dog, whether it's reactivity or whatever else. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, most of our dogs are not perfect. They have some issue they're working through. So kind of like you said, it's not the titles you remember, but often it's those little moments where you're like, oh, we finally achieved this little thing, or they just focused on me for the whole run or whatever it is. It's, it's often not like, oh, I got this title on June 15th. Yeah, Isn't exactly. Like, it's like, oh, no, I remember that run that we just had, like, that really great moment. Yeah, and if you're focused there, I mean, the awards come with time. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Like, and it may be not the first dog you start with. I, I won a lot less with my first four dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it takes, especially something like agility, I'll say, it takes a really long time to get good at it. And, and like, I'll say even with Tess being nine, we've only entered a few starters classes, but it's it's shocking how how long it can take to learn to, to kind of get those basics and then you know once you learn as the handler it's much easier with future dogs to oh it's so much easier until you get like a dog that's completely different than usual and then you have yeah. to relearn it all again <laughs> yeah. living through that a little bit so yeah so thank you very much for being on kind of our inaugural podcast um you know, i was a little nervous going in so thank you for bearing with me as kind of learn the tech and uh and we work through this i hope our audience got a lot out of it you know i've picked up a few tips from you here today so so that's great i really appreciate you taking the time to meet with us well thanks megan yeah. um and if anybody would like to learn more about you or some of the training classes um you're teaching you've got some online classes right now through hightails yeah hightails pet resort you can visit our website at hightails.ca all right, I think I've got it here, so I'll, I'm going to try and pull it up here and see if I can show some people what this might look like. Uh, so, oops, that's your website, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Com. So you can also go there if they want to talk to you about private training or... Um, yeah, and the online classes I'm offering through Where's Your Sit are going to be run through Hightails anyway, so okay. they're, all, they're all connected. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the Hightails website, so just hightails.ca. Yeah, exactly. Hightails.ca. And we have so many different online classes right now to choose from. Yeah, we've got a ton there. Okay. Well, great. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate your, your time and, and helping people out. Um, and again, you provided us with a little bonus checklist for people. So uh, if they want that, they can sign up for our uh, email through um, uh, dogsportsdecoded.com. And I'll email that out to them and uh, anybody on your list. I'm sure you'll send it out too as well. So perfect. Thank yeah. you again. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too.